Here are a few simple quasi-crystals as a result of the cut and project method where we project a slice of a higher dimensional lattice with different shift vectors. For those of you who are not familiar with the cut and project method, I'd like to give you a brief introduction here. As an example, we are trying to project from the two-dimensional square lattice to a one-dimensional quasi-crystal. First, we select the physical space, or the quasi-crystal space, labeled as E here. It is where the one-dimensional quasi-crystal lives. E per denotes the perpendicular space. Then we cut out a layer of the square lattice that is parallel to the quasi-crystal space and is bounded by the ends of this red segment in the perpendicular space. The red segment, the cut window in the perpendicular space, labeled by K, is the bounding window for this cut. It is obtained by projecting the Voronoi cell of a point to the perpendicular space. After the cut, we simply project all the points inside of the cut window to the physical space. Here, on the physical space, a one-dimensional quasi-crystal is obtained. The cut window can shift in the direction of the perpendicular space to change the point set in the cut window and cause dynamics in the one-dimensional quasi-crystal. These kind of dynamics are called phason dynamics. Now, let's look at a class of two-dimensional quasi-crystals as a cut and projection of the five-dimensional cubic lattice and its phason dynamics. In this case, the physical space is described by two base vectors, u1 and u2, while the perpendicular space is described by u3, u4, and u5. The cut window is bounded now by a three-dimensional polyhedron, which is called the rhombic triacontahedron, and that is a projection of the Voronoi cell of the five-dimensional cubic lattice to the perpendicular space. By shifting the cut window in the perpendicular space, in other words, in the U3, U4, and or U5 direction, phason dynamics in the two-dimensional quasi-crystal can be achieved. In order to explore this dynamical pattern in different ways, we define the shift vector, gamma, to be equal to alpha in the u3 direction, plus beta in the u4 direction, and omega over the square root of 5 in the u5 direction. First, we keep alpha and beta invariant and vary only omega from 0 to 5 in steps of 0.1. Notice that most of the slides in the animation here do not follow the Penrose tiling matching rules, and that is because most of them are generalized Penrose tilings instead of the true Penrose tiling, which does follow the Penrose tiling matching rules. We have found that true Penrose tilings occur only when omega are half integers. In this animation, we keep omega to be one half so as to keep the slides to be true Penrose tilings. And we keep beta to be zero. Then we vary alpha from one to five in steps of 0.05. Notice how the pattern dynamics slowly move from left to right. Notice that there are two types of supercell patterns here, each having a vertex at the center with five equally spaced lines connecting at the vertex. Now let's create different dynamical patterns by varying some of the parameters. In this animation, we keep alpha to be zero, omega to be one half, and we vary beta from zero to five in steps of 0.05. Notice how the overall tiling moves very slowly upwards. So there is a step down when the animation goes back to the beginning. Now this animation is the same as the previous, but we vary beta at a higher speed, at 50 frames per second. So now we can see the patterns moving upward, like boiling water or flames, but sometimes we can see parts of it moving downward, like wheels in movies. In this animation, we keep omega to be one half, and we vary both alpha and beta 
from 0 to 5 in steps of 0 0.05. Again, we use a high speed 50 frame per second rate of change. Notice how the patterns now move diagonally. In this animation, we keep the gamma shift vector to be zero. In other words, alpha, beta, and omega are all zero. Instead of translating the cut window, we rotate the projection plane. Or relatively, we rotate the Z5 lattice in the U1, U3 plane. Since this rotation changed the physical space, the projected tile shapes changed. The angle, phi, varies from 0 to 90 degrees in steps of 1 degree. The period is 90 degrees. Notice the slow overall rotation. The central star does not rotate, and four of its rhombi do not change. In this animation, we again rotate the projection plane, but avoid the rotation within the projection plane. The angle phi varies from 0 to 180 degrees in steps of 1 degree, and the period is 360 degrees. The animation shows half a period. The second half is essentially the same, but with the pattern rotated 36 degrees. Here, too, there is a return point at 135 degrees. This animation is the same as the previous, but the rotation is in the U1, U5 plane instead of the U1, U3 plane. The angle phi varies from 0 to 180 degrees in steps of 1 degree, and the period is 180 degrees. Here, the return point is at about 125 degrees. Next, we will try to generate phasons by modulating the cut window or fluctuating the projection space. The left figure shows a standard Fibonacci chain generated by cut and projection of the Z2 lattice. In the right figure, we add small fluctuations to the projection space, which causes dynamical phason flips to be produced. Equivalently, they can be produced by using a variable shift vector. First, we keep alpha and beta to be zero, but we make omega a spherical wave. In this animation, you can clearly see the radiating spherical wave patterns. This animation is a variation from the previous one, where we try to avoid gaps and overlaps. But the gaps and overlaps still occur although less frequently than when the coefficient was 0.2. Notice that this effect also happens with the Fibonacci chains in one dimension, two slides back. Now, making alpha to be a spherical wave instead of omega, notice the ripples that appear. And here we make alpha a soliton-like perturbation. In this animation, we undulate omega with this planar wave function according to this equation here. Then we undulate alpha with this planar wave function to generate this pattern according to this equation. So the purpose of this visual demonstration is to give some intuition on how space-time and particles may be modeled by phason actions in quasicrystals. In a three-dimensional quasicrystal, wave-like and particle-like patterns called quasiparticles would exist in a three-dimensional space. And the benefit of using quasicrystal phason dynamics to model fundamental unification of particle physics with general relativity is that because quasicrystals are projections of higher dimensional lattices, we can deliberately create our three-dimensional quasicrystal space by projecting a slice of a higher dimensional lattice that is specifically known to unify the particles and forces of the standard model of particle physics. And this is because an irrational projection of a higher dimensional lattice encodes or captures the gauge symmetry transformations that unify particles and forces in the higher dimensional lattice spaces and their associated higher dimensional Lie algebras. I'd like to thank Fang Fang, one of the senior scientists here at Quantum Gravity Research, 
for helping with this presentation.